Savior of the heavens and the earth, and may his peace and blessings be bestowed upon all his messengers and apostles, starting with the prophet Adam, and concluding with the last messenger, the prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be bestowed upon him and his divine progeny. I would like to thank you all for taking time of your busy schedules. I believe exams are right on the corner and you're attending this talk, so I will try to make it as informative as possible, allowing a lot of time for Q&A, because I think that's really the most important part of this discussion. Before I begin, I would like to start off to state that in Islam, the two most, let's say, well-known sects are Shiites, or the Shi'ism, Shia, and Sunnis. Sunnis are the majority, Shiites are the minority. However, one thing to realize is that those two sects are really brothers, believing in the same book, in the same tenets, in the same doctrines. Back in the 80s, in this country, in Canada, when they used to classify inter-religious marriages, they considered a marriage between a Catholic and a Protestant as an inter-religious marriage. Islam is not as such. Shiites and Sunnis are both Muslims. They get married to each other. In many parts of the world, they live right next to each other in peace and harmony. They work together. I'm originally from Iraq. And in my home country, there are many Shiites and Sunnis working hand in hand together. A lot of Sunnis go visit holy shrines in Iraq. And a lot of Shiites go and visit Sunni mosques. So they're really very close. And I brought in a picture here that, I don't know, I guess you can't see it here because there's not much projector, but you could see a Shia and a Sunni praying next to each other right here in the slide. This is from Bahrain. You, know, you might hear about Bahrain every now and then. But Shiites and Sunnis pray together, they work together. So it's not like we're talking about completely different religions, completely different backgrounds. But in relatively recent years, a lot of propaganda is being initiated against Shiism. And unfortunately, the lack of education, the lack of knowledge about what Shias believe in, who they are, propagates this kind of propaganda. So the whole objective of this session is really to realize what do Shias believe in and how close they are in terms of the doctrines between all Muslims, Shias and Sunnis. Before we start the discussion, in order for us to have a fruitful conversation and a fruitful discussion, we need to establish some basis for the discourse. We need to come to some sort of an agreement here. And here I will ask you for two things, two sorts of agreements that we must come to. First and foremost, there must be a trust between yourselves and myself. So the words I'm saying to you right now is what Shias believe in. And when I make some quotes about some references, be it Shia references or Sunni references, these are true. You can come to me after the session if you like and get the exact reference, what volume, what book it comes from, and I can give it to you. But we need to establish this trust. You need to believe that what I'm saying is the truth. Because without trust, we can't go further. So that's one thing we need to agree on, trust. A second thing we must agree on before we start our conversation is that Sunnis have their scholars, their writers, their interpreters of the Holy Quran, their narrators of the Hadith, which is the tradition of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, Shias also have their own narrators, interpreters, scholars, and so on and so forth. In the course of this conversation and this discourse, 
we will only use information that is agreed upon and authenticated by both schools of thought. Narrations, interpretations that well-respected Shia scholars and Sunni scholars agree upon. Those two things we need to agree on. If there are commentaries, traditions, mentioned in the Sunni school of thought and only in the Sunni school of thought, not authenticated by the Shiites, we will leave those ones aside. And if there are Shia commentaries and traditions mentioned only in the Shia school of thought and not accepted and authenticated by major Sunni scholars and interpreters, we will leave those ones aside as well. We will only come to those in the middle and agree on that. Because once it's approved by both schools of thoughts, then you can build, then you can move on. If we say something, and Sunnis, for example, say, well, we don't have this hadith, we don't authenticate it, then we can't go further. Or vice versa. Again, you can't go further. So we need to come to those two agreements. So one, a trust between myself and you guys. Second, is an agreement that whatever discussion we will have will be based on what is agreed upon by those two schools of thoughts by major scholars. We're all set here? Good? All right. Starting with the term Shia. The term Shia in the Arabic language simply means Follower, a follower. The word Shia appears in the Quran. Allah says in Surah number 37, verse 83. I'll give you numbers because it's easier to write. You can look them up later if you like. So Surah number 37, verse 83. Allah says about Nuh, Prophet Nuh, peace be upon him. وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ Ibrahim is among the Shia of Nuh. Okay? Shia in here means follow. Another verse, Surah number 28 or chapter 28, verse number 15. God says, فَاسْتَغَاثَهُ الَّذِي مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ عَلَى الَّذِي مِنْ عَدُوَّهِ His follower, referring to Moses, Prophet Musa, peace be upon him. Prophet Musa, one day when he was in the palace of the Pharaoh, left the palace of the Pharaoh, went to walk in the city, and there he saw two people fighting. One was a follower of Musa, meaning that he believed he was among the children of Israel. The other one was an enemy. In other words, he did not believe in the message of God. So here, the follower, the follower of Musa, his Shia, asked him for help, like come and help me out against his opponent. This is in chapter 28, verse 15. So in the Quran, the word Shia comes and appears. In the Arabic language, it means follower. Ibn Manzur who basically has written a dictionary, if you may call it, of Arabic language, Arabic, Arabic dictionary. In his dictionary, Lisan al-Arab, he says that, yes, the term does mean follower. However, the term became, over time, exclusively referring to the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. All right? So that's where the term Shia comes in. Why are they called the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib? We'll come to that, inshallah, in the course of our discussion. So as a word, it means follower. It appears in the Quran. Later on, however, the term became exclusively known as those who are the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This term, Shia, followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, was it given <coughs> By who? Who did actually name this term? Who did come up with this term? Was it Ali himself? 
his companions, sometime later, who came up with this term? According to a very famous non-Shia Sunni interpreter called As-Siyuti in his tafsir, and in his interpretation called Ad-Dur al-Manthur. Ad-Dur al-Manthur al-Siyuti. When he comes to the last verse of Surah Al-Bayyinah. Al-Bayyinah. He says, the Prophet, peace be upon him, one day was sitting down. His companions asked him about this last verse. They are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with them. They said, O Prophet of God, who are those people whom they are pleased with God and God is pleased with them? Who are they? He pointed at Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said, this man and his Shia, this man and his followers are those indicated in this verse. So the term Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib was coined by the Prophet peace be upon him and his divine family in his life. That's where the term came from. With regards to beliefs, what do Shias believe in? Before I get into that, I'll back a step a little bit and say, what do Muslims believe in altogether? What is required to become a Muslim? Who knows? What is Shahada? Can you explain a bit further? What do you say in the Shahada? Can, what do you confess in the Shahada? Yes, there is no God but Allah, so you believe in one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. This God has no partners, no associates, no children, no parents, and so on and so forth, as we read in the chapter 112 in the Holy Quran. Right? So that's monotheism. They believe in monotheism, tawheed, correct. What else is required from Muslims? Believe and confession in prophethood. They believe in all the prophets, starting with prophet who? Adam alayhi salam and concluding with the last messenger, and that is the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So they believe in all those prophets, that God Almighty has sent prophets. That's true, there's two things. There is one more thing, however, a Muslim must believe in. And what is that? One more thing he has to believe in, or she. Day of judgment, a day of resurrection, a day when all humankind will be resurrected and held accountable for everything that they have done in this world or said in this world. Okay, that's a day of resur resurrection. Those three things are believed in unanimously by all Muslims, whether Shia or Sunni. They believe in this. These are called the roots of the religion. Any Muslim, any individual, who says, I believe in the God who is only one God. I believe in all the prophets from Adam to Muhammad And I believe in the day of resurrection. This individual becomes a Muslim. That's it. We cannot explore further and say, does he really practice what he believes in? Can we, you know, what does his heart? We can't. We go by verbal. If he says, I believe in these, that's what we have to accept. Okay, so those things. These are the roots of the religion. All Muslims agree on this. In the school of thought of Shi'ism, there are two more roots that are added. One is the belief in Imamah. Imamah is the divine succession to Prophet Muhammad. That there are divine successors appointed by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa That's Number four and number fifth is divine justice, adala, the justice of God, that God is absolutely just in whatever he does. He's absolutely just. So in addition to the first three, 
two more things are added. So they believe in monotheism, they believe in the prophethood, they believe in the day of resurrection, all Muslims share this. Two more things, they believe in divine succession, imama, divine leadership, and finally they believe in divine justice. Those last two things, in addition to the first three, those five, become the roots of the religion. Then we have branches of the religion. Okay. People are Muslims, but they need to do certain practices, certain things that God has commanded in the Quran. For example, prayers, fasting, going to pilgrimage once in a lifetime. These things are considered part of the branches of the religion. Paying charity and almsgiving, zakat, that's branches of the religion. In addition to this, all Muslims agree, Shia and Sunni of course, that the Quran is the direct word of God revealed from God to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through the angel Gabriel, Jibra'i, alayhi salam. So this is unanimous upon Muslims. These are the agreements. The ideologies. Now, why do the followers of Ali or the Shia add those two, or at specifically Imam? Adala, I don't think there's much question about it that God is divinely just. It is the concept of Imam there. This is something that is crucial. And the question comes and stems from the idea that when the Prophet is alive, who do we turn to for our religious questions? Who do we turn to to get knowledge about our religion during the time of the Prophet? Who did the Muslims turn to? They turn to the Prophet, you know, it's one of those like Jeopardy obvious questions, you know. So. <laughs> it's an obvious question. So they turn to the Prophet. After the Prophet though, who do the Muslims turn to? When the Prophet dies, where do we go from there? Can we go to any companion, any individual? If that is the case, how do you define a companion? What is the definition of a companion? <coughs> any person who saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Holy Prophet, any person who saw him, heard him once, considered a companion? Or is there a criteria? He must have spent, let's say, six months with the Prophet, for example. Or he must have fought a battle with the Prophet, for example. Yes? Would it be like a disciple? A no, it's not a disciple. Because if we, I don't want it to be mixed up in terms of the Christian term of a disciple. When we, when we talk about a disciple of Jesus, we're referring to the Hawariyin, you know, those guys who the 12 disciples who kind of follow Jesus. So I don't want there to be a mix up here in that thing. So we will not call it a disciple because I'm afraid there will be a, a mix up in the, in the term, in the meaning of the term. People, I mean, this is the whole question is who do you define as a companion? There's actually a, a discussion here. Who do you define as a companion? Who's a companion? So anyone who sat with the prophet can he be considered a companion? Anyone who heard the Prophet, can we consider him or her as a companion? Or there has to be criteria. Or, let's even throw in another spin. Does companionship in itself have any merit? In itself, the companionship. The word companion in the Quran when we take a look from a Quranic perspective, does it really hold much? If we can ask you to move as much closer, or you in the back, maybe if you can move, come closer and join us here, please. Thank you. 
So, following up on this, on the term companion, <coughs> from the Quran, the word companion in itself simply refers as to someone who just associates with you for a period of time. You can have a travel companion, for example. You're traveling on the road, and someone comes along and says, can you give me a ride with you, please? That could be your companion. But does that give any merit to this companion? From the Quran perspective, no. How do we know this? Surah Al-Kahf, chapter number 18 of the Quran, verse number 37. God gives examples of two people. One is a believer, one is an unbeliever. The believer tells his companion, who is not a believer, قَالَ لَهُ صَاحِبُهُ صَاحِبُهُ His companion. وَهُوَ يُحَاوِرُهُ أَكَفَرْتَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَتْ his companion told him while he's having a conversation with him, two friends, two companions, one is a Muslim or one is a believer, one is not a believer. The believer is telling the non-believer who's a companion according to the Quran, do you reject, do you disassociate yourself from God, the one who created you? So which means here we have two companions. According to the Quran, those two are companions, but one was a believer, one was a non-believer. So there's companionship in itself holds no merit. Yes, they're both companions. But there is a huge difference. One is a believer, one is not a believer. At the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he had many companions, many people who were with him. Can we say all those companions are equal? The followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia says no. Some companions are better than others. Some are good. Some may have not been so good. In fact, according to the Quran, we know that there were a whole bunch of people living at the time of the Prophet who were known as the hypocrites. Hypocrites were people who lived with the Prophet. They prayed behind the Prophet. They even, in some cases, fought battles with the Prophet. However, their heart did not truly believe in God or in the Prophet. They had other intentions whether seeking materialistic gain, seeking some power, authority, or whatever reason. So those people were also companions, based on this definition. They're companions. They lived at the time of the Prophet. They saw the Prophet. They heard the Prophet. They may have narrated traditions from the Prophet. Shia school of thought says, we have to have a scrutiny about the companions. We can't say they're all equal. Some are better than others. Because of this, after the Prophet, I cannot just go back to any companion and ask about my religion from any individual, but rather from those individuals who are reliable, trusted sources, people who are scrutinized. And who is the most reliable of all those? The Shia say it is the Prophet's divine family, Ahlul Bayt. First and foremost, it is his daughter, Fatima, who was married to his cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and then his children, or grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein. Those two, those four individuals, have the highest authority. In addition to that, those individuals are ranked differently from others because they're the Prophet's progeny, divine family, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his divine family, in his lifetime, repeatedly stated that my successor, the person who will lead the Muslims after me, is Ali ibn Abi Talib, my cousin and my son-in-law. How do we know all this? When it comes to 
divine leadership in the Quran. Never have we seen a case throughout history from the creation of Adam until our holy prophet where a prophet of God told his followers that after me, when I leave, you guys can choose a leader. Never. Every single time from the time of Adam until our time of our holy prophet, the prophet is told by the God, by God Almighty, to appoint someone after him to lead. Every time God Almighty chooses leaders, chooses imams, chooses prophets, never has there been a case where God Almighty told a group of people, you can have a vote. Who would you like to be your prophet? Who would like you to be your leader? Never. It's always appointing someone. God Almighty says in Surah number chapter 38, verse 26 to Dawood, Prophet David, alayhi salam. O Dawood, or O David, we made you a leader, Khalifa. We chose you as a Khalifa. God chose him as a Khalifa, as a leader. In chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 124, God told Abraham, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, I am and I will make you a divine leader, an imam. Ibrahim alayhi salam was chosen as an imam, as a leader by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will make you, God is saying. In chapter 21, verse 73, God says, we made them imams, we made them leaders. We choose them as leaders, <laughs> divine leaders. So every